Hi there, this is Dave Nguyen, CEO of Brain Technology, and this is a pilot study quantifying the shape of endothelial micropatterning in cardiovascular organoids. We will analyze data that came from uh, Oscar Abiles et al. from this paper that's available on BioArchive. And in this study, they were able to induce early stage cardiovascular embryonic development in the form of organoid culture. As you can see here, they were able to induce this organoid to form three compartments. In green are the cardiomyocytes. Outside is then orange endothelial cells, followed by an outer ring of smooth muscle cells. And they found in this paper that notch and BMP singling are responsible for this type of patterning. So here are two figures that we will analyze in this paper. In orange are endothelial cells. As I examine these images closely, I notice that there is an inherent polarity to these organoid structures. The polarity becomes evident as the organoid matures. As you can see in day 16, here is the, um, you might call the head of the core region, extending out to the tail. And so this head to tail pattern persists in many of the figures and is likely an important axis within heart development. This will be important as we measure shapes in the following slides. Furthermore, upon examination, I see what looks like three compartments of endothelial cells. For example, in green here is the central core surrounded by a inner ring here outlined in blue. And lastly, there is an outer ring outlined in yellow representing the edge of the organoid. So it's clear that endothelial cells in these organoid cultures form distinct compartments that have recurring morphologies. This means that if you were to measure each of these images using the metric of average fluorescence intensity, you would lose all information about the structure of these subcompartments. Before we move on, let's quickly discuss how Shape Genie works. For example, in step one, if this blue object represents the outline of the shape you want to measure, then you can apply what's called the radio grid system, which is centered at the origin, this red dot, which is the middle of the bounding box surrounding your shape. And then from there, radio lines emanate in 360 degrees, which allows you to find every intersection of the radio lines with the edge of your object. This allows you to calculate the distance of each of these dots to the origin, producing the results in step four. And after this, you apply the fast Fourier transform on this complex sinusoid wave to get a frequency spectrum that represents the original shape that you began with. Now, though this frequency spectrum looks very complicated, a lot of shape secrets are hidden in these bars. And a way to simplify this complex data is to generate a scalar value in the form of an index. The most simple index, as described in step six, is to sum all bins together to get one number, or you can just compare one individual bin, say bin two, across every single sample. And that way you can reduce the complexity of this frequency plot into just one number to represent each sample, which is great for human intuition because that's what we like to think of, and is also great for machine learning predictions. One very special thing about Shape Genie is that we can measure something called pure shape, which has been impossible until now. On the left are these two objects. They are the same shape, but of different sizes. And if we were to measure them as is, we call that measuring them at scale. But when we measure something at scale, we're measuring both size and shape at the same time. Because traditional metrics such as area, volume, and perimeter, those metrics do not allow you to separate size and shape. Because the moment you resize an object, you've changed its area, perimeter, etc. But with Shape Genie, we can resize objects to be of the same, in this case, vertical height. What we did was we found the longest internal length of each object and we scaled both to be the same height. And in this way, when we measure them in Shape Genie, we measure shape apart from size. And when we do this, we make sure to constrain the ratio between width and height, that is the aspect ratio, so that we do not skew the image. Measuring pure shape in this way allows us to find many biological insights because shape and size are not the same things. 
First, we measure the outer edge of endothelial cells in these images. Here is an example of the outer edge of these organoids that we were able to identify. And in this case, we manually outlined them in magenta. And in case you're wondering, for images that were very dim, we were able to identify their borders by turning them into a binary image and then adjusting the threshold such that even the lightest pixels were saturated. And this allowed us to interpolate what the outer edge of the organoid would be. Another piece of crucial information to know is that since we know that the object has an inherent axis, as I described earlier, the head to tail axis, we made sure to rotate the mask after we extracted it such that that axis is horizontal. By aligning all samples in this way, we were able to standardize the orientation and thus get cleaner data. We, we do this because we found that nature is inherently polar, that is North Pole versus South Pole, anterior versus posterior, so on and so forth. And when we align our shapes according to these axes, these poles, we get cleaner data. For the outer edges, after extracting the at scale mask, we then resize them all to be the same width. And this is what they look like in their pure shape form. And these are the shapes that we measured in Shape Genie. We found that bin number two in the results did a good job of capturing differences in these series of images. As you can see, this graph represents the control group that's not treated with any inhibitors, that this index shows a gradual logarithmic increase. Looking at the same index in the treated group, in this case, 0.1 micromolar of the inhibitor, we also see an increase, but we see a st steep jump in day eight likely due to this finger-like projection, which appears but disappears as the differentiation continues. This shows you that we can derive an index that captures specific features of spatial information in our series. Another index that was informative was simply bin number three. In the control group, you can see that there is a periodic change in the magnitude of this index. When you look at the same index in the treatment group, you see the same pattern of periodicity, but that periodicity ends with a large increase on day 14. We left out day 16 in this series because we think the border was outside of the field of view. As you can see here, both indices capture very distinct kinetics in a way that is precise and objective. Next, we measured the shape of the inner edge of the endothelial cells. This figure shows how we manually outlined the shape of the inner edge or the inner ring. As you can see in the control group, this structure begins as a blob, but eventually takes on a standard form as clearly seen on day 12. And this same kinetic is observed in the treatment groups. In the middle row, the organoid takes on a blobular shape until day 12 when it adopts this pear shape pattern. And this pear shape pattern begins to change over time, but still maintains the overall motif. Same goes for the one micromolar treatment group. In this case, its preferred motif is reached earlier on in day 10 and persists to, through day 16. For the inner rings, we also align them like we did before according to the axis that's inherent to the organoids. And in this way, we standardize all the orientations before we measured their shape, also through this radio grid system. First, we look at bin number one as an index. You can see that for the control group, bin one shows a gradual decrease as the organoid differentiates. But very interestingly, if you look at the middle treatment group, you see that it doesn't find its preferred shape until day 12. And as you can see in the graphs, there is a steep drop between days 10 and 12, as if it's searching for its preferred form. And then when it does find it, this index drops and climbs again as the organoid continues to differentiate. For the one micromolar treatment group, it finds its preferred form earlier on at day 10. And so we see in the bar graph between days eight and 10, there's a steep drop. And in this case, this shape index continues to decline over time because in the case of this last treatment group, the pear shape morphology maintains but gets thinner and thinner as opposed to the 0.1 micromolar group in which the pear shape gets wider and wider. I just want to point out that we measured these shapes at scale, meaning we measured both size and shape at the same time. 
But next we wanted to measure their pier shape. And you can see here a comparison side by side on the right is what they look like in their pier shape form, standardized by their width. And in this way, we measure shape apart from the effect of size. First, let's look at the control group. In the box on the left, you see that between days 10 and 12, the organoid finds its preferred or adopts its preferred shape, which continues to persist through day 16. And you can see that reflected in the graph because you see a steep jump between day 8 and 10, and then a drop from 10 to 12, similar to the theme we've seen before in the previous slides, when the organoid finally finds its preferred shape motif, and then it continues to refine that in the following time points. If you look at the 0.1 micromolar treatment group, you see, again, a very distinct threshold. Then the first three time points, this index decreases, but once the organoid adopts its preferred shape motif, there's a steep change in this index, and then that index begins to be refined as the time points continue. For the last treatment group, we see that it finds its preferred shape motif on day 10, and that this shape motif gets flatter and flatter as opposed to the other groups. And this is reflected in the graph on the right, but this index represents flatness by increasing its magnitude. It's interesting to compare the last three time points because these are the three time points in which the organoids have reached their preferred shape motif. And based on this data, we think that bin number three of the pier shape measurement represents the flattened pair shapes adopted by the organoids that received the inhibitor. As you can see in blue here are the controls and in orange and gray, the bars are much taller because as you can see visually, the treatments cause the inner ring of these organoids, endothelial cells, to take on that pear shape morphology. And you can see in the middle row that this pear shape gets wider and wider, which is reflected in the orange bars. They get smaller over time. However, for the one micromolar treatment group, this pear shape gets thinner and flatter over time. And so you see the gray bars increase. So our conclusion from this pilot study is that measuring shape reveals more biological insight than measuring average fluorescence intensity, as shown on the right from the paper that we are analyzing. Though measuring average fluorescence intensity is informative, it says very little about the micro patterning that's happening, especially in the cases of complex organoids that have multiple compartments as seen in this study. This is the end of our tutorial. We hope that Shape Genie helps you find amazing things in your data.